Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to our program. My name is CJ Kruska. I'm the campus director here at Cooley Law School. And I'm very happy that you're joining us today for a kind of important occasion for us as we enter this week of Art Prize in Grand Rapids. Everyone's talking about art, it seems. So we thought it would be really appropriate to do our art unveiling, our new Calder piece that we've acquired for the Cooley Collection during the same time Art Prize is being held in Grand Rapids. And our MC for the uh, program today is Associate Dean of International Programs, Bill Weiner from our Lansing campus. Thanks, CJ. Welcome, everybody. We have several art-related things to do today. First, we are going to, to uh, unveil our Calder lithograph. Second, we're going to hear a presentation by adjunct professor Stephanie Neal. And finally, we'll have some refreshments. And then Professor Paul Carrier and I will take folks around the building. If any of you are interested, we'll sort of play docent and show you some of our rather new art collection that we've been building here in Grand Rapids. The Art at Cooley project began in 2005 uh, with a generous grant from our president, Don LaDuke. Since then, we've been acquiring art. Uh, we don't have a formal mission statement, but we sort of informally are looking for Michigan artists or legal themes or some connection to our now four campuses. Uh, we have an informal committee. This is academe after all. You can't do anything without a committee in academe. Uh, Professor Carrier, who's here today, is one of the members. Uh, and we have several art savvy alumni who help us out as well. As I said, the school has a growing collection of paintings, prints, photography, and sculpture. We've spent President LaDuke's money. We've asked him for more. He obliged. We've spent that now, and it's a new fiscal year, so I'm preparing a memo to ask him for more yet. We've received cash contributions, and perhaps more importantly, we have been given about half of the items in our current collection. So if any of you are feeling generous today, I'll accept checks for the Art of Cooley Fund or your works of art, again, as long as they meet uh, one or more of our uh, loose goals. The entire Cooley community, we hope, can benefit from our art acquisitions and installations. We know intuitively that our art broadens and enriches the student experience at all of our buildings. Studies show that exposure to the visual arts can help stimulate the creative process. And after all, we're problem solvers, that's what we're about, and we hope that this can all help us become better at problem solving. Well, why a piece by Calder? Uh, we don't very often target specific things for our collection. It's just sort of happening as we move along. But we knew that 2009 would be the 40th anniversary of the installation of Calder's La Grande Vitesse in Grand Rapids. And we wanted to join the club, if you will, and acquire something appropriate by Calder to help with that celebration that the museums in town have been working on this year. Here's a bit of background, admittedly incomplete, about Alexander Calder. Today, I'm emphasizing the French connection. Calder had a Paris studio beginning in 1926. He created the Cirque Calder, Calder Circus, which was a group of small pieces depicting a circus. He carried this thing around in suitcases. He could get it into three or four or five suitcases, and he would display it. He used pieces of wire, string, cloth, metal, etc., to create the circus. And here's a photo by Andre Curtez showing Calder and part of his circus in 1929. This year, the Whitney Museum in New York and the Pompidou Center in Paris developed a Calder retrospective. Uh, they called it the Paris Years, 1926 to 1933. And they had a beautiful catalog of this show, and we've added a copy of the catalog to our art library. Uh, we try to get a book or two about the various artists that we collect. Uh, Janice Hunt, who's helping today with the, the PowerPoint presentation, keeps all of those at uh, her desk. It's a part of the Cooley Collection, and you're always welcome to check one of them out and read them. Okay, let's jump ahead to 1962 when Calder is back in France 
and he's setting up a studio in the tiny village of Sachet in the Loire Valley. I have a personal nice story, I think, about Sachet. Uh, after teaching in a foreign study program in Oxford in 1998, uh, my wife and I and our two young kids had rented a country place for a week near that very little village in, in the Loire Valley. We were going to see all the famous castles. The owner said, you will never find us. We're out in the country. Go to the main square in town. There are some telephone booths there. Call me. I'll come and get you, and I'll take you out to the renovated farmhouse, and then you'll know the way. Well, we're wandering around. Uh, I've got a bad map. I'm going to get the good map when I finally get there, but we left Paris. At one point, I ended up on the wrong side of the Loire River. We had to double back and find a uh, bridge, and it's beginning to be like one of those episodes of The Simpsons where Bart keeps asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Because uh, i got two kids in the back seat. All of a sudden, I thought I found our town. I made a sharp turn. I pulled to a stop in this little parking lot, and my wife said, are you sure this is it? And I said, I think so. The sign on the wall says Plaza Alexander Calder, and look. And here in this little plaza was a piece that Calder had given to the town where he had the studio. It's turning slowly in the breeze. It's a mobile. More about that in a minute. And yes, indeed, we were there. And lest you think I'm making all this story up, that's me on another day standing under the same piece. So, so Calder has moved from small to big. He's moved from a circus that he can carry around uh, with string and wire in a suitcase to great big pieces like the one in the, in the square there. Uh, how did this happen? Well, he was heavily influenced by the abstract work of artists like uh, Pete Mondrian and Joan Moreau, and he created sculptures which in turn created new words in the art vocabulary. Mobile was a term used by a French artist named Marcel Duchamp in 1931 to describe Calder's early mechanized sculptures. They were mobile. They moved. And that sachet work is a good example of a Calder mobile because it would turn gently in the wind. Then a little later, another French artist, uh, Jean Arp, uh, like Duchamp, he was a part of the, the Dada movement, and he used the term stabile to talk about Calder's static pieces and to distinguish them from the mobiles. And the famous piece in Grand Rapids that Janice and I detoured to drive by today, La Grande Vitesse, is a stabile. It doesn't move. Our committee was looking for a print. We wanted something like that, but there's only so much money you can ask of the president. So we were looking for something we could afford. Uh, and we wanted something with some curves to it so that it would connect us to La Grande Vitesse, and we also wanted some of that famous Calder red color to also link us to the Grand Rapids piece. Well, here's what we found, and if Professor Carrier will join me for a second, we will carefully unveil our new piece. Give that to you, Paul. Thanks. This is a paper rendition of a large sculpture purchased by Michigan Bell in 1970. It weighs 17 tons, and if any of you are Detroiters or have spent that time in downtown Detroit, this one has really become a Detroit landmark. It's called Jeune Fille et sa Suite, Young Woman and Her Suitors, or Her Entourage or Her Followers. The uh, curved shape in the front is the feminine part, and the more vertical shapes, three of them in the back, those are the guys. And they're following her around, and perhaps in an era before texting, they're having a little chat. Uh, their heads aren't down, they aren't looking at their screens and not paying attention to the other people they're with. And now Janice is going to show you a little YouTube video that we also found. This piece, which you're seeing both in the YouTube video and on our print, 
started out black, as it is in our print. Somewhere along the way, someone decided to repaint it Calder Red. During some conservation work in 2006, the sculpture was repainted black. And then AT&T, no longer Michigan Bell, it was now owned by AT&T, they donated this piece to the Detroit Institute of Arts. And it was reinstalled near the museum in 2008. And so the video we have is the process of bringing this piece back together from restoration, moving it from Cass up to the Farnsworth side of the DIA, and it's being reinstalled. One of the questions I always have is, why do people do silly things like repaint a black sculpture by Calder red just because they like red better? I've read about another Calder that didn't fare nearly as well as our jeune fille, which as you can see is back to being black. A collector donated a black and white Calder mobile to Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. The county said, let's put it in our big new airport. And so they bring it inside and they say, oops, it's a mobile, it might conk somebody as it's moving around. So they locked it down. In effect, they changed the vocabulary. The mobile became a stabile. Then they said, we don't like black and white, let's repaint it in the county's colors, green and gold. You, you just got to wonder, you know. Are we, we are almost done here, so I'll slow down just a little bit. We are going to start this piece in Grand Rapids because, of course, it relates to Grand Rapids and our Grand Rapids campus and La Grande Vitesse. But, as you know, we have uh, a relatively new campus in Auburn Hills and a brand new campus in Ann Arbor. And because both of them are only one county away from the piece you're seeing here at the Detroit Institute of Art, I think one of these days this piece will also wander down to Ann Arbor and to Auburn Hills so that the people there can see it and then go see it outside. Okay, La Grande Vitesse again. Let me show you one last Calder Stabile, which I had the good fortune of seeing this past summer in Seattle. It's at the Olympic Sculpture Park, and that is a brand new place in downtown Seattle, right on the waterfront. It's a fascinating nine-acre site that used to be sort of a fuel storage area, and it was one of those wasted waterfront areas in the big city. And it overlooks the water, and it's become a part of the Seattle Art Museum, or SAM, organization. The park itself has been open for less than three years, and it's really becoming one of the must-do stops in the Seattle area. This one is called Eagle, and it was finished in 1971. So it really makes it a contemporary of the other two pieces we've talked about today, La Grande Vitesse, 1969, Young Woman and Her Suite or Her Followers, 1970, and Eagle, 1971. It's really a powerful piece. It's very graceful. It's soaring. I like this shot, because there's Seattle's landmark in the background. And they've done a very interesting thing here, though I couldn't quite get it on one of the pictures. Uh, on the walkway to and from uh, Eagle, they've set up a number of chairs for people to stop and rest and take a look at the piece. And guess what? They painted them all called her red. So it's a nice little touch, I thought. Well, that's enough for me, from me, and on Calder for today. I'd love to talk to you about the airplanes he painted. He painted two full-size airplanes. Actually, he worked with engineers for Braniff International Airways and painted them. Uh, he wouldn't paint them himself, the engineers would, but he would always show up and get up on a scaffolding and, and do one of the engines on the side. Uh, and then he did a flying colors series of prints for Braniff as well. Uh, but that's another topic for another day, and maybe we'll have that one a little bit later. Uh, so this is our piece. I hope you like it. Uh, it will stay in Grand Rapids for a good bit, but we're also going to share it with a couple of our other campuses. Now, let me turn you over to an expert, because you've just been hearing from an art amateur, 
Uh, and now you're going to hear from an art professional. I'm very pleased today to introduce Stephanie Neal, who is a Cooley graduate, a member of the Bushnell class of 1980. Did I get that one right? And she works for the Grand Rapids Art Museum, where she's in charge of donor development and planned giving. Last term, Stephanie uh, was an adjunct professor for Cooley and taught art, cultural heritage, and the law. It went very well, and I'm hopeful that we offer that elective once a year here in Grand Rapids. So Stephanie, welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Weiner. I was a student at Cooley when there was only one campus and uh, all of our classes were at the Masonic Temple, and that's where the library was as well. There was no air conditioning either back at that time, so you can re just imagine how long ago that was. But our professors were extraordinary. I made some lifelong friends here at Cooley, and I cherish the experience that I gained as a student here at Cooley. But I do have to confess that my legal experience has left me scarred. I was out uh, enjoying the art prize uh, experience last week and walking along the river in downtown Grand Rapids. And I came across some beautiful pieces and looking at some 3D sculptures. And I stopped with some friends to look at a, a particularly beautiful piece. And I stopped and remarked, isn't that a beautiful statute? <laughs> Has that happened to you? Now, in the legal field, you know, we have our own quirks, obviously. And I don't think we're ever going to get over that uh, speech impediment that we have. But lay people have their own uh, problems, too, in the art world. And so I want to talk a little bit today about intellectual property and the art world. And the Calder piece that you see here uh, brings some uh, particular experiences to mind. At the Grand Rapids Art Museum, we have several Calder pieces ourselves, and I have some handouts for you. And on page 16, you, ha you can see some of the Calder pieces that we have in our permanent collection. And they, they illustrate some of the Calder mobiles and stabiles that you heard Professor Weiner speak of. We also, in celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Legrand Vitesse that you see projected here, we had a Calder exhibition. And in the audience at one of our art forums for the Calder exhibition, somebody stood up and mentioned that when this particular piece was given to the city of Grand Rapids, that the artist in giving this to the city of Grand Rapids also gave the copyright for it to the city. Now that's a common misperception. The person just assumed that in giving the work to the city, that in giving it to a, a public entity or a city government, that the piece transferred the copyright, and that in giving it to a public body, it entered the public domain. There are several fallacies there. First of all, it wasn't a gift to the city. It was the first piece of art that was funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. So it has some significance for that reason. Also, when art is uh, transferred, the physical transfer of the piece, whether it's by gift or by purchase, does not transfer the copyright. The copyright remains with the artist. And transferring a work to a public body or a governmental entity does not transfer the work to the public domain. So don't fall into that trap. Uh, the work remains, the copyright remains with the artist. So when I speak of the public domain, 
Why is that important? What's the significance of the public domain? Well, it's important for several reasons. When a work enters the public domain, it basically becomes a creative work that's available for everyone to use. So how does that happen? It can happen several different ways. There are basically four reasons or four ways something can enter the public domain and be available for use by everyone. One way could be that the copyright has expired. Another way could be that the artist or the author has failed to perfect the copyright, hasn't followed the statutory requirements, and the copyright has not been perfected. There's also a special rule for law professors, and that's it's available under the fair use doctrine. Some artists or authors also release the copyright. So sometimes on the internet you'll see that the copyright is expressly released. Also, some uh, works by government, U.S. government employees are not protected by copyright. So if it's done by a government, a U.S. government employee in the course of their work, their official duties, it's also not protected by the copyright. And it's available for use by everyone. So what's the term of a copyright before it enters the public domain? That's going to vary depending on when and where the work was created. Was it foreign or domestic? And it will depend on whether or not notice of the copyright was given. So before you assume something has entered the public domain, you're going to want to do some further research on that. Now, I mentioned that the work, when it's transferred, does not transfer the copyright. So what do you do when you have a work and you want to use it? You want to publicize it. So when we have exhibitions at the Grand Rapids Art Museum and we want to publicize these great exhibitions or these new works that we receive, how do you publicize that and not run afoul of the Copyright Act? Well, copyrights can be acquired separately. You might want to purchase the work and purchase the copyright. Or you can make separate arrangements for that with licensing agreements. And that's another fertile area for lawyers who want to do uh, intellectual property law. So two separate steps, purchase or acquire the, the work of art and purchase the rights or acquire the rights to publicize that. When you do acquire the right to use a work of art, Artists or authors have the right to receive attribution or credit for the work. And it's important to, to credit authors or artists appropriately. I know lawyers are always look, looking for good samples on how to do that appropriately. So this can also serve as a form book for you. In here, there are any number of, of photo credits in here. So uh, this might serve uh, as a good um, sample for you to keep for future reference. Also, at its most basic level, sometimes you have to ask yourself simply, what is art? Because that can vary from case to case. In the art prize competition that we're hearing about now, the art prize rules basically define art as an output that can be exhibited in a space agreed upon with the hosting venue. That can include a performance, projections, balloon art. It can include impermanent art. On the other hand, for art to be tax deductible, the IRS includes very specific examples of what the art has to be in order to be tax deductible. So they'll have a list that includes things like paintings, sculptures, watercolors, 
prints, drawings, ceramics, antiques, and other similar works. On the other hand, to be copyrightable art, three requirements have to be met. The art must have originality, cannot be copied. It must be a copyrightable subject matter, something that's listed in the Copyright Act, such as a literary work, a musical work, a dramatic work, even pantomimes. Uh, pictures, motion pictures, some other specific things that are co uh, listed in the Copyright Act. And it also must be fixed in a tangible medium of expression, or it must have permanence. So an ice sculpture, for example, would not be copyrightable. But a photograph of an ice sculpture would be copyrightable. But a photograph of a photograph of an ice sculpture would not be copyrightable because it wouldn't have that originality requirement. Another example might include wrapping a bridge in bubble wrap might constitute, quote, art for purposes of art prize, but it's not gonna cut the muster when it comes to the IRS or the US Copyright Office. So sometimes you really have to stop and ask yourself, what is art? Because that may vary from context to context. So there are a lot of different rules that apply for intellectual property and these may not always be intuitive. So there are a number of different resources that are available for you out there. Uh, one of course would be this law school. If you have an interest in this area, there are a number of intellectual property courses available. And in this community, we also have the Grand Rapids Art Museum and a number of other wonderful resources for you. So, so pleased that you came today, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. And also, I'll stay for the tour and be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephanie. That was most interesting. Uh, I was sitting back in my chair relaxing, and I said, boy, this is good. And I almost had to reach for a pen and write a few things down because uh, I enjoyed the presentation that much. Well, this concludes our program. Thank you all for coming. Uh, please come up and see the Calder. Uh, give it a look. You'll see that it's signed and numbered, and uh, we're very excited by it. And again, uh, the, the good folks at Grand Rapids have set aside some uh, some refreshments for us here, and in a couple of minutes, uh, Paul and I will take a few of you around if you'd like to tour the building and see what other nice pieces of art we have. Again, thank you very much, uh, and uh, do what uh, Janice and I did today, and that's uh, be sure to spend some time wandering around Grand Rapids looking at all the art that is out there for Art Prize. <laughs>